to everyone. This is the Business of Betting podcast. Today is episode 25, and we have a very special guest, Harry Finlay. Harry needs no introduction. He is a superstar punter who has an illustrious gambling career. Harry discusses many things, including his involvement with Star Lizard and Asian handicaps, how he sees the betting industry, and some of his infamous betting stories. Harry's biography, Harry Finley, Gambling for Life, written by Neil Harmon, contains so many of these great stories and is well worth a read for those who enjoy this episode. Watch out for a couple of curse words in the first 90 seconds of the chat, though. As always, you can find us at businessofbetting.com or at bettingpod on Twitter. Please fire in any questions or feedback and potential guests you'd like to hear from. So thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy Jake's chat with Harry Finley. Today I'm joined by Harry Finlay. Harry, thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure, pleasure, Jake. So Harry, normally we go into background, but as everyone knows who you are, why don't we start with your early days? There's a great quote in the book which you recently released, your biography, Harry Finlay, Gambling for Life, written by Neil Harmon. In the book, it mentions a Greyhound, Belaninska Band, who won the Derby final in 1970. And there's a quote, I knew I was a genius from that moment, and in essence, I was fucked. Do you want to take us through your early days and what shaped you as a punter up until that point? I think just basically, the, I mean, the, I'd, I'd been playing fives and it's a game where you play against the wall knockout and pitch and toss and all early teenage years stuff, uh, sort of age 12 to 15. But it was the the first night that I went to Greyhound racing that that, that uh, I was really fucked because I just I just took my breath away. And um, that was at Slough, a place called, I don't track this closed now at Slough, they're nearly all closed now in England. But uh, I went to Slough on the Saturday night, I was at Wembley on the Monday and it would have been two weekends after that that my mum took me to White City to teach me a lesson. And uh, White City is, was the greatest dog track on the planet. And I saw that very first night I was there, I saw Belinska Band fly to the corner. I've never seen a dog go to the corner any better ever since. And uh, when I backed him at 20-1 to 1 to win the derby, ended up winning it. I, I, by that time, I, I had sort of realised I was a pretty good judge of a dog. And that I was fucked, yes. And... Um, the advantage was in those days, Jake, but there used to be dog meetings in the betting shops where there was no pictures, commentaries only. And I'd, off, I'd skive off school the last year I was at school and I'd go to Hackney and Watford live and watch the racing live. And like a lot of other sports in those days, watching it live when no one else was there or not many people were there was a big, big advantage. And I can, many times I can remember backing dogs at 5-2, to 11-4 in the old days when I was 16, 17, 18 that... Should have been near even money, and uh, it was those those sort of those sort of bets that kept me afloat for those first couple of years uh, after I left school and refused to become part of the um, the working working you know have a job basically. I couldn't hold a job down for for love nor money. So, what was a typical night for you back then at the the races or at the betting shop in you know those teenage years? Were you spending a few hours digging through some of the horses and going through the newspaper, or were you? Just... No, I'd be going. No, I'd be going dogs. Joe, I'd be going, I'd be spending my whole day trying to work out what dog I was going to back, and I'd be going to dogs every night. I'd go to dogs every night of the week. I mean, it was so easy to buzz the trains in those days. So, even if I was skinned, I'd go to the dogs, um, or you know, you know. I, I very, 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 very rarely missed a night at the dogs. Um, I was just, I was a sad old. I was six nights a week. There was no Sundays in those days, but on a Saturday morning, I'd get the train really early. I'd get the milk train into into London, and then I'd get to Hackney Wick on a Saturday morning, which was my favourite place as a teenager, full of characters. Um, and uh, I'd go to Hackney during the winter when Harringay was on. It'd be Hackney in the morning, Harringay in the White City, um, at night, three meetings a day, and that was paradise. Needless to say, the GRA have closed those tracks down now. So take us through a typical night. You, you roll to the track. Is there well, there ain't a typical people? night, Jake. Some, there ain't a typical night. There'd just be some <laughs> nights I'd go with 10 quid and come out skin. Other nights I'd go in with, with five quid and come out with 30 quid. So it, obviously, like any other gambler at any stage, it's massively depends on the result. But basically, 
I was very, I was, a, I was a good, clever staking punter even as a youngster. So if I went to, so I went to a dog track with 15, 16 quid in those days, I wouldn't be thinking I'll have two quid a race and have a guess up. I'd be thinking, right, I've got my 15 quid. I'll have six, fiver on that, two quid on that. And, you know, I'd have my, like, I'd, like I would now, like today I'd know roughly what all specs were having and, or, you know, what, 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 what I'm going to do basically in advance. And it was no different. Even then, I, I, I don't think we change very much from when we're 16 to 56 and, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I was a pretty good staker, even even going back to those days. Where did you develop those skills as a teenager? I, I don't know too many who had clever staking ability as a youngster. Maybe there was some sort of fear as a, a well, teenager. I, I, I say, yeah, there was. Say clever staking. I mean, I made, I mean, I remember one night I had 700 quid in my draw, which was, at the time was like nine million pound, and I was going to South End, and it was all sprint. It was the, it was a silver salver competition for dogs over two bends. And I actually, I left the, I had the 700 quid, which is a, which is a massive tank for me at the time. I'd have been 16, no older, 16 just sort of thing, 16 and a half maybe. And uh, I, I, I deliberately left 500 quid in the drawer and just took the 200 because it was sprints. And I went back upstairs and thought, well, there might be a photo or you never know what you might need the money for. Just take the whole seven. And I actually went back upstairs to get the other five and I ended up losing all the 700 Euro, all those seven hundred pound that night, and that I still remember that night. So that I learned such a lesson that night. I can remember it. I remember it clear as a bell. Being in a pub on South End Seafront afterwards, eating prawns out of a pint pot, and having a pint, and just wanted to want to jump off the edge of the pier. I was so so annoyed at myself because I knew it was sprinters and I knew it was precarious. And I, I, I you know, lessons. Sometimes you, you learn lessons in gambling, and you really. They really leave you leave the mark, but even at that stage, I, I, you know, I wasn't like a lot of gamblers. You get a lot of good staking gamblers, Jake. But it's all about how you perform when it goes wrong. You can get many gamblers build up a lot of money over a long period of time, and then suddenly they'll have one terrible, fateful weekend and lose it all. And that's when your staking as a youngster becomes really important, as it does through life. How you handle yourself when the, when the shit hits the fan. So can you take us through, you, you mentioned a little bit about your sort of betting style and I, I read through the book, you know, pretty avidly and saw some of the comments from others in the book about how you came to be such a, a superstar punter and there was stuff in there about uh, Julian Snow had a good comment where he said it was instinctive synthesis where you, you're an expert at knowing the true odds and then backing the, you know, the dog yeah, or the team I'd, or the horse. I'd say, I mean, I work with, Tony Bloom for a long time, and you know he's he'd be he'd be he'd be the best I've ever met at pricing up. And he was Tony Bloom's like he gets every bit of information he can juice out of you, and he he'd always be it, it, the, the silly things he'd ask me to price up and things. And I suppose I always I always have had an instinct to football, especially I don't I find pricing up football very very easy. You know, um, currently I end up on a lot more outsiders and a lot more overs than I used to, but. I've always found pricing up football pretty pretty easy, and um, and now, nowadays you're playing against the machine. So basically, when there's a goal or a sending off, you've got sort of 15, 20 seconds to get on before the syndicates click into gear and, and, and take advantage. And in those days, it was, it was a different type of punt. And as a teenager, it would be nearly all the big odds on shots were were, were way overpriced. Um, also, it should have been four on in a novice chase with two to five and four to nine. So as a teenager, most of my weekends would be digging out a, a treble or an acre for the weekend. Maybe one horse at two to five, one dog at White City, uh, one football team, and, and 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 something like that, and and go for a roll up. They were my favourite favourite type of bets. Very very much as a youngster, maybe a snooker player in there as well. Maybe Steve Davis. Uh, uh, that sort of accumulate a bet, even as as a youngster between the age of sixteen and twenty one. You wouldn't want to be laying my accumulator every week. It would definitely would ship with, with you know my weekend acre was a was a profitable um, profitable bet over the years. So I want to touch on the accumulator a little bit later, but for the I guess finding the true odds or understanding the true odds, was there some type of method you used, or was it all in your head and you just had an uncanny ability to be able to compute all that information? Well, it sounds t- it sound that sounds a bit flash to me. Basically. You ain't got to be Pythagoras to work out. 
the bookmakers, I mean, I'm going back 30 years, Jake. It was so different in those days, you know. Like nowadays, I'd say nine, the biggest change in gambling is how computers and young people have taken over the game. So computers and algorithms don't have any human weaknesses, i.e. it's very hard to find any normal human being who'd bet seven to win one, even professionals. Even I've known up until a few years ago, Top people consider them top gamblers and clever people say, I never bet odds on. I mean, what a load of shit. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's when I was a kid, that was all I got all the time. Whenever I went in betting shops, all the black guys, oh, how can you bet seven of all on? All the old Irish codgers, oh, how can you bet odds on? Bet quickest way to the poorhouse. And uh, I mean, I like, I remember betting horses in novice chases. It was the best game in the world. I mean, I, I, I make a statement. Um, Overall, in my lifetime, before I met Glenn, I wasn't even in front back in horses, but I was in front back in novice chasers at short prices. That I can guarantee you. Uh, but obviously, all that has changed so much now, Jake. All the, the tennis players I used to bet at 10 on and 8 on and 9 on, and now they're 50 on and 30, the same matches are three, four times shorter in price. Same in Australia. With the, I told everyone in Australia five, six years ago when... I was backing horses at a dollar thirty-five. I said in, in five or six years these horses would be a dollar fifteen, and I, you know I'm not exaggerating. I've been proved a hundred percent right. So not only am I good at pricing things up spontaneously, I'm pretty good at, at, at guessing which way the markets are going to go and where you know I know when to get out. And for those listening, um, Tony Bloom is a, a shrewd gambler as I've ever met, and he he met Neil talking about the book, and he said something very something very interesting during the book. Uh, this would have only been three or four months ago. Tony Bloom explained to Neil Harmon, and Neil's not a gambler, um, but Neil, Tony Bloom said that if he was doing the same thing now that he was six years ago, he wouldn't be winning. Now, they are. They, I mean, that, that, that tells you all how much, how, how much the gambling environment changes. And in the book, you know, I think that if you read the book and you're a gambler, you'll enjoy it more than you're a non-gambler. But I also think if you're a clever gambler, and you understand odds. It's only the idiots that think I'm an idiot. And I think that the, um, and there's quite a lot of them, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but um, but I think the clever gamblers. I think that I think that if you if you read the book and you know nothing about gambling and you're a middle aged woman, you'll get a good few laughs out of it. But I think if you're Tony Bloom or Matthew Benham and you read the book, you'll think it's faultless. So I think bearing in mind Neil's not a, a, a gambling man, um, and that's an understatement. Uh, I think that's a good way of describing it, and that was what that, that was what I hoped. No, it was certainly a great book. I suggest everyone get their hands on a copy and have a read. It was certainly I I think I sent an email to someone and said if half the stories are true, then it's an incredible life, and uh, I have no doubt that they're all one hundred percent true. So uh, they're they're more they're, the only, the only feedback I've had from people I know and people that know me well, they all just say it's so. It's so brutally honest. It's so every story is so spot on the truth. And the truth is that there's so many unbelievable stories that you, you know, I dedicated it to the rabbit hose, but I'd like the layer cake at the start because, you know, basically there's so many stories that you that, that you just couldn't tell. And um, over a period of time now, and thinking that, that a few of them will come out, and there there there's they're some real funny crackers that we haven't even put in yet. <laughs> <laughs> So it sounds like the market's developed and changed a lot from your teenage years when you were oh. to now where, you know, you mentioned what you said about Tony, how in, you know, in the last six years, there's been a lot of change. It sounds like some of the value or some of the edge in the market's been extracted. Is that true to say? Oh, I mean, example, I mean, um, the last two years, two and a half years after what, after I nearly killed myself trying to save dog racing and the BHA coming after me and all that crap, I, I've been fighting for my life and I've had to win. But I haven't been doing accumulators, Jake. There's been hardly any hackers at all because they're all, even the firms, It's all, everyone knows how to price everything up now. And the only shrewd cash bets I've been having are the NRL 600 and 1,200 quid bets with English bookies when I'm getting the news overnight. But even that this season has really, really, really tightened up. And, you know, whereas the season before, this season's coming to an end now. We've got the grand final Sunday. But I've literally only had two or three cash bets this year. Um, whereas the year before I was having plenty and I was diving into Exeter on the train and having like 600 here and 600 here and, and getting myself on, it, you know, it's even that market in one season has really tightened up. 
But I think that all the markets will tighten up and I, I think it will become better for bookmakers because I think that the Bet365 and the Paddy Powers have had their time. And I think that the betting will change and there will become, the, the landscape will change. There will be a another platform like a Betfair where everyone's paying 2p or even less than 2p. And, um, you know, betting gets its respect back because these fixed odds betting terminals have done gambling no good at all. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward in the next few weeks in various roles explaining why they're so bad for the sport. There's a big letter in the Racing Post today from a Conservative MP saying how badly it will affect racing if um, these fixed odds betting terminals get massively reduced or taken out and how racing relies on bookmaking and without this funding, racing is worried about Gold Cup and worried about this. He's talking absolute bollocks because fixed odds betting terminals have done terrible damage to greyhound racing not quite as much to horses but you'll never know how much harm it's done to the respect of gambling and sports betting and you know no one else bets no one bets on anything else in betting shops in britain now it's like a law that no one talks about you know you go in and watch a race at cheltenham or even a, a big meeting like ascot on a friday and no one's watching the racing no one gives a shit about the racing fixed odds betting terminals have no place in society. If you want to have, if you want to be mad enough to bet on red or black, do it in a casino. At least you know it's straight. And at least if you lose, you haven't got the brain damage of thinking, was that really straight, or was it was it a ring? You know, how would how could anyone risk that kind of money on the? You know, if I was going to risk a thousand pound on a red or black, I'll tell you what, it'd be on a bona fide roulette wheel on a bona fide table in front of my eyes. I wouldn't leave it to some crypto computer to, to pick the winner. No, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm against them, and um, I, I believe that they're doing a lot of harm to sports betting and the reputation of sports betting as well. So, what do you want to see change then? I want to see. I just think that the. I just think that Betfair lost sight of the goal. I think that Betfair should have taken over the world. I, I think that um, they're, they're link up with Paddy Parrott. It's so interesting to see that their CEO now has said that he's in favour of bringing the machines down to under a tenner. I think the rest of the industry would have been absolutely appalled by Brian Corcoran saying that. But um, he's a corporate marketing man. And I think, you know, he's, he's leaving Betfair himself. I think I think the Betfair shares have taken a massive increase purely because of him and how he works. And I think they're in for a fall as well, unless they go back to, to what it was all about originally. And I do I do believe that in five years' time, there will be a platform where all sports traders will play and that there won't be um, any rebate or any kickback and everyone will be playing the same rate. You know, right from the start, from the first day of Betfair, it is not right that a small small punter betting in fivers and tenors and 20 quid is trapped with 5% commission, knowing full well that the bigger he bets, the lower the commission will come down. And it was always their weak link. And, um, you know, anyone who can, even, anyone who can count to seven knows how hard, how much harder it is to win playing 5p commission over two and um we want a level pl level playing field for everyone that's what that's what i'm looking for yeah and i think a lot of it's to do with regulators or regulation and not fully understanding what impact uh imposing certain you know whether it's taxes or things like yep. that on the on these companies will do because essentially it, ultimately it just gets passed on to the end punter and they get screwed every time yeah. So until that changes, so what? What about the tote? What place do you see for the tote, if any? Do you think the twelve, fifteen percent commission schemes on totes plus rebates is a problematic scenario? I think that as you read the you read you read the book, so you you know I think the re, the massive rebate. You know, I mean, the Australian system is so much better than anywhere else, but they started eating themselves alive by giving their biggest winners the biggest rebate, just all all sex towards turnover, and with Betfred and. And Philip Phil Sears have done the same thing over here, and they've they've just sold themselves. The the takeout now on the horses is up to thirty percent, and the win. I mean, anyone who bets win and place in British pools or even the place pot, there's all these idiots betting place pots all the time without realising they're just consistently losing all the time. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But we've got a glimmer of hope in Britain that a guy called Baron Marantelli, who's a forward thinker, um. Colossus Bets, they've actually, they've, they've now signed up and they're involved with what was going to be the on-course betting. And 
I wouldn't be surprised if they take it a step further. Like you say, regulations and authorities have a big part on that. But um, I do believe that that tie-up with Colossus bet significant. And I, the Irish tote, I was involved with a bid for that seven, eight years ago that was bomb-proof. I was involved with David Burnson of Global Wagering or Global Totes in America, a shrewd guy, and Ed Cummings, who's the shrewdest guy to ever work for the English tote. But um, Brian Kavanagh and Horse Racing Ireland didn't want it. But, I mean, their tote at the moment is worthless. And the whole of Irish betting is governed by Labrooks and Paddy Power, who I see very much on a downward curve. And uh, I'd still, even 10 years down later, I'd, I'd love to get my hands on the Irish tote and really shake up the uh, the betting model over there because it needs it. And it would do their race in the world a good because there's too many, there's too few people with too much power in Ireland and a real clever, high-volume tote would, would do wonders for their betting market. So there must be a reason why these executives, and it may be just naivety and lack of understanding, but there must be a reason why these executives are almost always choosing to, when they're making a decision, it's increased the takeout. There's a, I think there was a quote in the book about Betfred and the tote well, takeout up to more than 15%. Is that right? That's what they've done. That's what they've done. I mean, so what's know, the rationale? What in, what's their thinking? Why do they think it's a good idea when almost everyone I speak to says it's ludicrous? Well, you you tell me. I mean, I, I nearly killed myself doing what I done at Coventry. I took the totes down to thirteen percent. I I done it all right and done everything per, the perfect model for a perfect betting platform. But um, you know, I mean, it, the, the the proof's in the pudding. They are the the tote is now worthless. They've destroyed the scoop six. They've destroyed the jackpots as we know it. And the major reason for that is they've got two enormous players that are getting laughable rebates. When you give, when you're playing on a scoop six, where you get a fifteen, where fifteen percent of the state money goes goes to the place, and you give massive rebates to two players, the the places are given anyway by the size of their their investment, and basically they're getting fifty percent of their money back and flooding the pools, and it, it, the, the, the literally the tote in Great Britain. And the tote in Ireland, they are now both completely worthless. And 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 I, and I do think with people like Bernard Marantelli getting involved, that's a big breakthrough. That's a big change of tact. And um, I could see I, I could see possibilities of big big sporting rollover bets. Don't forget that they all talk about the Perry Mutual in France like it's some great invention. The Romanet family, and we're here and we're there. What a lot of crap. They've got the whole legal system in France behind them. No one, if you're a compulsive gambler in France, you can't, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to, you can't even get anywhere near a casino in France to get in. The only way you can have a bet on anything is horse, football, anything is with a PMU. So, of course, their figures look good. Of course, their turnover look good. And they can talk the big talk about co mingling pools and all that. But there's no co mingling. There's no big South African Faramella and all this talk. Where's the big bets? Where's the big rollovers? It's all, it's all just, it's, if we had the same rules, if we had the same rules for betting, tote betting in England as we had in France, I could turn the British tote into trillionaires in 18 months. So the success of the French totes is worthless. I mean, you know, the, people talk about them as a shining light. I mean, do me a favour. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is we need people like Bernard taking over these and getting involved in these, in these things and, I do think that will happen. And as I say, Bernard has signed, Colossus Bets have signed up with the race course. At the moment, Edwin Osborne was doing the British totes for Chester race courses and race courses like that, where they were just doing 10% less than SP. Now, the, the SP industry in Britain has been around for 10 years. But ordinary working class people were turning up at Chester race courses for a day out, betting on what they thought was the tote, but it was actually a company just settling all bets at 10% worse than SP. I mean, my retired Graham could do better than that. He's lying on the floor. And this is what this is what people are praising and saying how clever they are. I mean, no, 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 no. I mean, a country like Ireland, you imagine what they could do with a sort of takeout I at Coventry and someone like me or Bernard Marantelli doing rollovers and football rollovers and instead of all the pubs in Ireland being next door to Labrooks and Paddy Power who won't give you a dollar I want you to bet three runners in football matches and 140% on handicaps and have Ruby Walsh doing all their adverts and jockey knocking on people's doors. No, 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 no. We could have an Australian model, all these brilliant Irish pubs with a with a government-based tote in it, all just 10% on horses and 10% on dogs. 
Give the give the greyhound industry, give the racing industry some respect back. You walk in a bar in Australia, you go in a bar in Australia on a Monday afternoon and watch the American Super Bowl matches, people betting on trotting, people betting on horses. People don't look at them like they've got one leg or one arm or they're criminal because they're having a bet. This is what this is what Britain needs. This is what Ireland needs. And it can be done without the Australian mistake of the rebating system. Oh, I'd love to take over the Irish tote, Jake, and really show them how it can be done. I can hear it in your voice. I can certainly hear it in your voice. And if you talk to a, a handful of Australians, they might say that their system's stuffed as well and the rebates are rubbish and all this sort of stuff. So it sounds like things are over there are no, a yeah, the, more... the, Listen, the, Australi- the Australian problem, the Australian thing, they they let themselves down with the rebates. They, they had... They had the Australians should have got they had three or four totes. Some of them weren't big enough. It's hard for these people to work together. And like in Australia, you have the legislation problems. But make no mistake, the thing that most ruined your tote or affects your tote is the rebate. Because you're, it's, you've started it. And all you're doing is giving rebate to the people who don't need it. If you want to work out a rebate system, you, give a re, you find a way to give losers and small players a rebate. Then you've got a rebate system. But when you're giving the when you're giving the mega blue sharks, the blue whales, all the krill, you you, you it just get there's none there's no krill left in the ocean, and that's exactly what's happening in England. Betfred's done it so quick, it's just laughable. If you saw the turnover on the jackpots, if you took out the two main rebate players in the play spots, tote jackpots and and scoop sixes in Britain, what you'd have left is a shell. You'd have hardly any money in the pools at all. They're all playing with each other's money and figures, all hoping they'll do some deal with some South African and say, this is how much we take on the tote. This is how much we take on the jackpot. This is what we take on the scoop six. But they don't take those figures. Those figures are massively quadruple inflated with the figures from the two big fat whales. So they don't count. The tote's worthless. We all know it's worthless. Anyway, move on to the next question, Jay. We can't talk about totes on <laughs> Well, therein lies the problem. If they've got two big whales and they're relying on those, if they go away, then they're probably petrified. Yeah, but they, won't, so... they won't do it forever, Jay, because I'm going to tell them. I'm going to bring it. I'm going to be the man who stands up and takes on Ray Winston and says, no more, Ray. No more talking about this flash club where we go mountaineering and bet with Bet365 <laughs> at the same time as we're skiing down a slope and drinking Vermont cocktails with film star birds. It's all over, Ray Winston. <laughs> It's all over. Samuel L. Jackson, go back to America, watch your baseball and your basketball, and don't try and tell British ordinary 10 and 20 pound punters to cash out with bet 365. We don't want to know. Let me tell you about cash out. Free time. How much time do ordinary punters on Betfair on their phones spend worrying about pressing the cash out button? Even if they don't press it, they're wasting time. They're getting 181 instead of 183 because they're worried about cashing the cash out button. And for Betfair, it's the biggest waste of all time. Why do you need a cash-out button? You can trade out of it. If you bet 8 to 11 and you don't like the look of them and they're playing crap, lay them back at 180. Don't, don't cop out or sell out or whatever it is. It's laughable. It's, it's called, laughable. It's called hedging. We, it was already in play, but now they've got a fancy name for it. And they splash it all over your phone. And it says hide. And even when you press hide, it doesn't hide. It's still there. <laughs> the biggest thing you see on the screen, flashing, costing you money every day. Tony Bloom, how did you get started with Tony? What was your relationship and, and what brought you both together? Oh, just, I mean, you, you've got to read the book really to find out how I met his dad. I knew about him before that. I beat him at Blockbusters in Terry Harrison's betting shop. Um, but no, I just, he, he he's a guy who, who, who I liked, liked, liked him straight away. I could tell he was clever straight away and on the ball. And um, to be honest, he started as my American football guy because that's, that's what he told me he was good at. And... Um, he was one of the first guys to find the Asian handicap football. Unfortunately, when he did, he um, he was clever enough to, to know that I was the ideal man to have helping him get the prices right in the Premier League, along with my old pal, to- Scotch Tommy Bradley. And that shows how clever Lizard is, because no one else would have thought about me at the time, but he knew. So, without, that's, 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 and we had a good few years together on the football, and he, he, he took over the world, and uh, good luck to him. Were you involved with the Star Lizard operation at all? Oh, I was. I was. I was with that when we first started. He, um, the first, the very first start of it on the Premier League was it was me, Tommy Bradley, and Tony Bloom. No one else, just the three of us. Friday night, Friday night. Uh, if Lizard made a team six to four and I made a team seven to four, 
and Tommy made it two to one. Seven to four was our price, and that's how we that's how we operated for two or three three or four years. Uh, and then Liz, Tony got more and more people involved, and um, went from there. Really, when Matthew Benham, by the time Matthew Benham arrived to work with Tony, they were um, he only listened to me. It went, I mean, but originally the, the three prices, to, Tony would ring me every Friday night. He would insist that I got Tommy Bradley's prices um, without any effect to me. So I, Tommy had to tell me how he priced up all ten games. I priced up my ten games, and Tony did the same thing, and we used that as our basic uh, basic platform. And um, I mean, who else would have picked me? But to- Lizard knew not, how, not just how good I was; he knew that I was friends with Tommy Bradley, and he knew that was crucial. Getting that extra great experienced opinion of Tommy's, and uh, me and Tommy had already been working together for fifteen, twenty years on and off. So um, yeah, very clever move from Tony, and now he's. Uh, Taken over, you know, as I say, he's a very successful businessman and doing well. So, what made it so successful, other than having, you know, four of the brightest minds in the game working together? Is that all it was, or was there? Tony, Tony, very quickly took it to another level. I mean, Tony's just, uh, you know, looking back on those early years, I think I had a lot of influence on Tony outside of gambling, lifestyle, and things. And you know, looking back on it, that's that's one of Tony's expertise is getting as much. You know, he had a lot of really good people around him. A lot of people have left now, left on good terms, a lot of them. But um, he's he, he, he's just he just he just finds a system, and he he will find something, and he'll adapt a system to to make money out of it. And uh, that's that's what that's what that's what he does. And he, I mean, don't get me wrong, we worked together like that for a few years. But as I say, when when Matthew Benham come along, uh, and they they were they were working in that at Camden together, Tony would ring me on a Friday night. And he'd hardly be listening to me. He wouldn't, you know. What, and I realised what me and Tommy, what Tommy and I, with what prices Tommy and I made anything, made almost zero effect on Lizard's algorithms by the time we we, we stopped doing it. But um, Tony's loyal, and he kept me on uh, until we had the fallout. He kept me on everything as it was. So no, it was it was it was, an inter- it was interesting times. I mean, someone was talking about it the other day, and I I remember in the first couple of years we used to have. Um, when it was really, you couldn't lose really, Jake, because you'd have, there'd be 10 matches in the Premier League and I'd probably bet on seven or eight of them. Whereas now I bet on none of them. Now I hardly ever bet and it's so changed. But even four years later, we were only betting on one or two games. But when it first started, we were betting on seven or eight, maybe nine games out of the 10 and laying out between, for me personally, between 10 and 60 grand maximum. And that was the most I was allowed to have on seven or eight games. And I used to sit in the armchair at five to three waiting for Jeff Stelling. And I'll be so excited because I knew, you know, we used to win nearly every week. I mean, it's just fantastic. And I was allowed, Tommy Bradley and I were allowed to have up to 20 grand up. We were allowed to bet early on the Thursday or Friday. So if me and Tommy knew someone had broken the leg or the goalkeeper was out, and you know, no one else at Star Lizard, not even Tony Bloom was allowed to have a uh, bet on the Thursday or Friday because my, because my input was so important and so you know, regular and reliable. I was allowed to have 20 grand on the Thursday and the Friday and then a maximum 20 on the Saturday. So I could get, I was the only one who could get in early. I mean, some of the positions we'd be in on a Saturday. I, 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 I wouldn't have sold my position for 15, 16 grand before kickoff. Yeah. So to have that, to have that kind of confidence every Saturday, I mean, I remember one of the first bets when we were on comp and Preston North End were playing Arsenal in the, in the cup, in the, in the, in the milk cup. And that was, I, I was the one who put Lizard in the milk cup route straight away <laughs> and because um, I do love a team that ain't trying that hard and I remember I remember we got like plus two and a quarter or something on a team I remember we got plus two so lose by two and you get your money back yeah and I said to Tony I said I ain't even sure they're not favorites and I mean you know it was just crazy at the start what it was like and decent stakes as well Jake you know 20 grand bets of that so how are you getting so much money down well because Tony and Tony t- listen mate Tony Bloom was the first man to find it. He had all the accounts. Like you've read the book, you read the book, mate. When I when, I, when he done sixteen grand on a pitch and putt, as I walked off, as I walked off, I had the sixteen grand in my pocket. It was like a brick. And um, you know that's the way he operates. He's, he had a good name and a good, you know, and he he's a good man to do business with, I suppose. And he he was the first man there. I mean, if you're the first man, if you find gold in whatever they find gold in America, if you're one of the first guys to find where it is, you're gonna, you know, and you have got Tony Bloom's brain. You're going to make a lot of money out of it. 
So in the book, it mentions you had a star with Star Lizard or Tony. What what does that exactly mean? Well, a star is was his was their betting unit. You know, these these are questions that you you need to read the book. It explains the star system pretty well. But everyone at Tony Bloom's, everyone who works for Star Lizard gets a share. Even the cleaners, even the cooks, and that's that's a great thing. And I mean, I spoke with this about Lizard. I was a good influence on Tony and. Things like that are so clever that every single person, even the cleaner, while she's cleaning the offices out at three o'clock in the morning, going in the toilets and cleaning them, Star Lizard is get, setting in place bets at the very best prices all around Asia, and they're getting a tiny bit of the action. I mean, what a way, what a way to be. I mean, even the even the cooks come in, they, they have a brilliant canteen at Star Lizard, but they're all on it. They've all got a tiny little bit of the action. Yeah. So instead of getting paid three hundred, you know, say a cleaner takes home. 680 quid a month if they were star lizard they'd be taking home 717 a month or whatever yeah yeah and that yeah. you know that difference is massive and i remember I, you won't like me saying this tony but when we first started when we first started the first year we started he said to me harry he said what price do you make us make me to win over the year this year i'll never forget it and i said well i said we can't really lose tony i said but i said i suppose about Two to, I think I think I was a real mug. I'm ashamed to say this. I laid him two to eleven or something like that, and he bet me eleven thousand to win two. And the second year, I think he let me bet me a twelve. I think the second year he bet me something like a twelve thousand to one on, or a, that, that we'd show a profit. And the third year, I let him bet me something like a twenty five thousand to one on that we'd show a profit, and he bet it on. And that was when he laughed at me and said, "Harry, you know, you remember you laid me two to eleven three years ago when the real when the real price was oblivion." The real price was oblivion, you know. But that was – Lizard got a lot of fun out of beating you on the odds, no matter what it was. And uh, I want to touch on owning horses. There was a great quote where you said, any gambler knows that owning a horse is nothing like having your last 200 bucks on an evens chance or, or whatever. Having a bet is essentially the only form of ownership. Obviously, if you get to own a horse like Denman, it's a little bit different. But what got you in and I guess kept you in owning horses? No, absolutely freakish. I, I, I never wanted to own a horse, and I, that's why to this day I've never had one even running my own name. Because as a young man, I always said I'd never own a horse uh, because there's no point, and uh, for that very reason. And the only, only reason I bought horses originally was my mother was a retired nurse, a very good nurse, and my brother found her pinned under a patient, private nursing, under a wheelchair, and it took him two hours to sort it out. And I said, that's it, Mum, no more private nursing. You need a hobby. At the same time, I met Paul Barber, a gentleman. You just couldn't meet a finer English gentleman anywhere in Britain. And you could trust him with your life. And after meeting him, I said to him, Paul, I said, would it be, you know, would, would you get have a couple of horses with my mum to get her out of the house and get her to come racing down in Taunton and Devon and all that? And that was purely how it started. And the fourth horse we bought, I think, was Bloody Denman. So I never, won't, well, I never wanted to own horses. And there's a brilliant interview on, say it myself, listen to me, brilliant interview, <laughs> on our UK next Tuesday night. But it goes into detail of how much, you know, you a betting on horses is, is you know, like I've owned Denman, a Gold Cup winner, and I've owned Royal Ascot winners, and I've owned all But I wouldn't recognise any of them if they were in my back garden now. I've got a retired greyhound here on, sat right next to me from Coventry Dogs. Dogs are different. And if you want to exemplify what I'm talking about, look at Black Caviar and Frankel. I've got black caviar. Mean black caviar and Frank will mean more to me than Denman does, because when I when I was in under pressure with a BHA, when I was not not in the best of terms of myself, both those horses remained unbeaten. Everyone gets beat. Nuriev, Ajax in Australia at one to fifty, Northern Dancer, Shergar, every horse gets beat, but black caviar and Frank will never done, and they mean more to me than any other horses. And uh, as a gambler, I remember going to. Having, your, having your, all your money on a horse like Sabindu Luar or Panto Prince Ascot on a Wednesday afternoon or Little Owl in a novice chase. Oh, they're horses that, that I love. So, yeah, I, I, that, that's my favourite part in my, in my favourite interview where I explain to ordinary punters, don't even think what it's like to own a winner. Just, just have 200 quid on and cheer it on and make it your last 200. And you'll, you'll know exactly what it feels like to win a Gold Cup. Yeah, I think even on a Saturday, the last race, when you're down to your last 20 and you have that same feeling and you're betting somewhere oh. where you've never been or never heard of the jockey or the trainer or the horse, but it's that exact oh, you, feeling. 
Jake, I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly what you just said there. I was 16, 17, and there was a dog at Slough in the last race on a Saturday night, a 5.95. And I knew it would be free clear at the corner. It was a tight track, and I knew it would be free clear at the corner. And I I had £200 in the world, and I had the whole £200 on it evens. It went off about 8 to 13. Anyway, it was slow away, and it made the corner, went round about a length in front. Anyway, that night, it, it held on by a short head. It won by a short head. I wasn't even sure it won the photo. And that night, in the, in, I was in the nightclub with, three, with 390 quid on me, half past one in the morning, having a dance with a girl, listening to music. And I just thought, oh, I promise you faithfully, that felt like I won the Gold Cup. And that was 200 <laughs> bucks at evens, a dog winner at Slough. And that would have been almost 40 years ago. And I'll tell you now, I can remember every single yard of the race like it was last week. So that feat, believe you me, that is as good as winning, winning any big race as an owner. I have no doubt and most of the listeners, if not all of them, have had that same moment, that same oh, feeling. Oh, absolutely. Can... absolutely. Absolutely. So you, you have an affinity with Australia and Australian sport. Before we get to the Rabbitohs and maybe the Australian cricket team, do you want to just talk a little bit about why you were so infatuated with going to live sport and you would travel around the globe, uh, you know, at the drop of the hat, it sounded like, to go and see a, a darts, a snooker, cricket, golf, tennis, whatever well, it was. It's funny you say that, Jake. I was just thinking before you come here about my old mate in Australia, Simon Beasley, and Aussie Rules. He was the Gary Lineker of Aussie Rules, but he's more of a Jack the Lad than Gary Lineker. Uh, Simon's a real old-fashioned Peter Osgood type, blonde-haired centre-forward, top goal scorer for Footscray, the Footscray Bulldogs. Yep. I, I hardly knew Simon, and he said to me, the first two times, the first year I went to Australia, I was skinned. And you know why I went? Because Simon Beasley had a lovely family home in Melbourne. And uh, beautiful family house. And he said to me, Harry, he said, I'm going up to Queensland with a family for four or five weeks over Christmas, always do. He said, why don't you and your family come and stay in my house? And two years on the trot, Simon Beasley had me in, Aust- had me in his family home. All my family staying in his family home. Beautiful place in Melbourne, two years on the trot. And that f- that, that that changed, you know, that, that those times with my family in Melbourne over Christmas just – confirm what I already knew, that Australia is a place for me. I remember the first time I arrived, 15 minutes I arrived, I just couldn't believe it. I went to watch Richie Richardson smack a 167 at, at, at the MCG. And um, I was staying at the Hilton opposite the MCG. And I, I knew after 15 minutes of being in Australia, I wanted to spend the rest of my life there. And every single time I arrive, I, I get out of the, either in Melbourne or Sydney or up in Brisbane, no matter where it is, as soon as the door is open and I get outside, I can smell it. I just start laughing. I always start laughing. And that's the one reason why I'm scared of going to live in Australia is because would I, would I be that? Even now, I'm so excited now about I'll be in Hong Kong on the, the 6th, I'll be at Happy Valley on the Sunday night, and that nighttime flight, I'll be on the way to Brisbane. And it's the only time I really get excited when I get on a plane is when I know when I get off it, I'm going to be in Australia. I can't wait. <laughs> so tell us about the Australian cricket team then. I, I was told you were the thirteenth man, and I said, "Well, that can't be true. There's only twelve in a cricket well, well, team." And then obviously the story. Tell us how you got involved with that. Well, it's so funny because I actually shared a hotel. We, me and Bradley, were in Colombo in Sri Lanka for a for a few, for a quite a while, a few weeks. And uh, when Aussies, Aussies were playing playing over there, and um, they weren't staying in the same same hotel as us, but they kept coming over the road to use our Italian restaurant to have pizzas by the pool. So I was talking to a few of them then and got on quite well with them and chatting away, and and uh, as you do. And then all of a sudden, about four months later, I'm in the hotel room in Melbourne, and it come, Glenn McGrath was talking about this 13th man for Australia, an auction. I'm thinking, this this can't be right. They're never, there's never going to be really the 13th man. But, oh, no, Glenn McGrath was saying, oh, no, you really are the 13th man. You practice in the nature with, with the team all day, the team bus, the – in the dressing room, and I just said to Bradley, make sure I win that auction. Don't care what it costs. It will never happen again. No one will ever be allowed to do this again. I'm, I'm doing it. And um, bang, next day, who won it? Fat Harry, 35, <laughs> 35 Aussie dollars, and I was there. And um, I was a great experience. I learned a lot about cricket. It was just such a it – was, it, was, it was one of the best 35 grand I ever spent purely because of what I learned. And um, – it was worth it just to see David Boone's face when I walked in the dressing room. I thought he was going to explode. He saw me from about 40 yards. 
and the, the Aussie woman whose idea it was to have the 13th man. Oh, and when he saw me, it was bad enough. And when I opened my mouth, oh, but I, I ended up winning him over and uh, it was a day I'll never forget. I, I would imagine Ricky Ponting was probably playing. His nickname is obviously Punter. And then I don't know if Mark Wall was there, but there's a few guys in that team back in that era who probably had a few good punting stories as well. So I'm sure for the, was it 35 grand you paid at auction? Yeah. Well, I got I, I jumped in the van with Ricky and I was friends with a, with a, with, um, a good pal of his when he was a kid who played with in Launceston in, um, in Australia. And, of course, he's a big greyhound man. Um, there was a fantastic track. The one other white city at Launceston, which closed down. So I remember speaking to him about that because now Launceston dog track is just on the inside of the trotting track. But the old white city at Launceston used to be a fantastic um, dog track in in, in in Tasmania. So uh, we spoke about that. And obviously, and I remember speaking to him about uh, when Gilchrist walked in the semi-final of the World Cup and what Ponting said to him when they crossed on the way to the crease. Because I, oh, yeah. I knew that Ricky was fuming. I knew that Ricky was fuming. And uh, and it affected him. I think he I think he scored two runs off four balls, and um, it was it was my, my big mate Andrew Simons who come down and, and and won the game further down the order. But uh, no, it was it was it was it was a real eye opener for me. So tell us why the the Rabbitohs uh, mentioned in the book. I think you dedicated the book to the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I, after what happened with the Greyhound game, Jake, I was I was I was gone. So I was finished. I uh, had nothing. I, I, I spent the last two million of the family's money trying to save greyhound racing. So it wasn't like losing two million on the All Blacks. It was like losing two. It was worse than losing two million on a fruit machine because I couldn't even win. I wasn't trying to win anything. I was just trying to prove a point and save the dogs. And suddenly I left my family with nothing. And uh, as a fifty-year-old who was unemployable, my CV wouldn't get me a job stacking shells in Tesco's. I, 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 I didn't. I certainly never had the confidence to believe I could still win at gambling. So to all intents and purposes, I was in a, in a very black spot. And I, to this day, I believe that if I hadn't have had the four grand with Shane Philippeck at uh, 15 to two on the, Oz, on, on the rabbit, I was to win the, the, to win the grand final before I left, before the shit hit the fan back in England. I think that bet saved my life because that's what got me w- watching the NRL in the mornings when I realized I had a chance when I saw them win at Barlow Park on Chris McQueen's birthday, and they were all so happy and so excited in that humidity, running around like lunatics, I thought this team, this team's got it. They've got what it takes. They've got the esprit de corps. They've got the ability. They had five or six world class players in the team, all at the top of their game. And um, I, I, I just, I'll never be able to thank the Rabbitohs enough. I spoke to Matt, Madge McGuire, the coach, this week. I've actually. They're struggling to get the books in Australia. I've sent them a book this morning. I've sent a dozen of them. I'm mates with a few of the NRL lads now, and they're such a self-deprecating, piss-taking bunch of lads. I love them. If you on the front of the book, there's a picture of me with my hand on my chin, and um, I've had every single one of them sending me pictures of themselves with hands on the chin, <laughs> taking the piss out of me. And then we managed to find one with Laurie Daly, where he's doing exactly the same thing, but even worse. And when I was, when that was an Irish journalist found that for me, and when I sent it to when I sent Shane the Lorry Daily one this week, it, I had to pay five hundred quid to see his face when he got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that those Aussie right there. You know, to me they're all legends, but when you meet them, they just piss taking lunatics, and uh, they're they're my, that kind of humour, that kind of piss taking humour is right up my street, and I, and I love it. So before I let you go, a couple more things. If you had 500 bucks last night on Earth and you had to go watch live sport or an event or go to a track, what's Harry Finlay doing? I'd definitely, definitely watch the NRL. And I wouldn't be able to change my bet. No hedging. No, have your bet and watch it. And that's why the one thing, the one sad thing about the NRL for me is the no more Monday night games. Because the Monday night games were, um, the Monday night games were Monday mornings over here. And getting a big NRL game on a Monday morning to me was it, it was just it, that was just the greatest thing. So I do miss the Monday morning games, but definitely it would be it would be um, it would be on the on 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 the NRL on a handicap bet or a, even better a straight bet, a game that's really close. But I've, that was always my favourite, and it's just coincidence that now it's it's my major it's been my major earner for the last two or three years. Interesting. Now, Harry, what's up next? Obviously, we've, I, we could chat for hours, and I'm very, very grateful for your time. But what's what's Harry up to in the next, you know, six, twelve, eighteen months? I just think that 
with this book being a bit of a being as much of a hit as it is already, and not many, not that many people have read it yet, I just think that there's a chance. I, you know, I'm speaking at a big traders conference in London for Matchbook on the first of November, and doing a lot of work before that. And I just feel, I just feel it's my duty to bring down Ray Winston and Samuel Harris, uh, Samuel L. Jackson. I just feel that maybe you know, I just feel that if it, it, I don't know why it is. Jake, but I always get on better. He mentions in the book that I know the Sangsters and Guy and his brother Adam, who's a great lad in Melbourne. But to be honest, I get on better with their kids. I've always got on better with the youngsters and enjoy their company. And they seem to enjoy the betting more. And I believe I've got a message to all those young football punters that are betting on Bet365 with their phones and cashing out when they're one up with 10 minutes to go. Maybe there's an opportunity for me with this book to st stand in front of 2,000 of them and tell him for over an hour and a half just how it can be done and how it should be done and the way to do it. And then perhaps if those same 2,000 people come back in 18 months' time, instead of only a handful of them being maybe long-term -term winners, maybe 15, 20% of them are long-term winners. And even if they're not winners, long-term, they're not losing as much and perhaps enjoying their punting a bit more. And more importantly, perhaps not feeling so bad about their punting when they do back a winner, a loser, or get something wrong. I'm always, always the clever guy. There's a guy called Mick Stone who always says the best thing that ever Harry Finley ever says about gambling. I don't know Mick that well, but he's right. That when you're back in winners, when you're flying, when you're, when you're at the races at Rose Hill on a Saturday afternoon and the sun's shining, you bet three winners at around the five to two mark and you feel you're unstoppable. Your next bet, if you bet three winners on the trot all around that sort of price and the next race you have, you're winning two grand and the next race you have $400 on a six to four chance, when you start watching that race on the TV or in the old days with the binoculars, you genuinely believe that six to four chance is going to shit in. And you genuinely believe that while you're watching it, it's only a matter of time until it cruises up on the bridle and away she goes. But it's still a six to four chance. Right. Yep. If, you're at the, if you're at the races, you, but you're just waiting for it to come cruising up. But if you're at the races and you've bet three odds on losers, you bet seven or four odds on a horse that's missed a break at the start, you've then bet two on a horse and... Somehow it's got in trouble, didn't get the run, didn't like the ground, got beat. Next bet, you've bet an even, an even money shot that's got beat. If after those three terrible losses, you have six hundred, you have 400 bucks on a six to four chance and the race is off and you're watching it on a telly or with the binoculars, you're just waiting for it to come off the bridle. You're just thinking to yourself, oh, I can't believe, if it's still going well at halfway, you, you, you're saying to yourself, I can't believe that horse is, is still going well. Surely it's going to come off the bridle. It can't possibly win. And that's in the short term. But in the long term, that's what gambling's like. So you've got to keep your, you've got to keep your equilibrium. You've got to, when you're back in losers, you're never as bad as you think you are. You're never useless. You've, you know, you've got to live out of gambling somehow. You haven't got a job. Your fucking family done had a good lifestyle. So don't start getting down on yourself when you can't back a winner. And by the same token, when you're absolutely flying, don't get too cocky. Don't put your head above the parapet. Because in gambling, the second you get a bit lazy, the second you think that it's almost uncanny, no matter what, whether you're betting in 20 quids, 50 quids or 50 grand, you all, the second you start thinking you've got it, you can afford to just bang. You'll get your head blown off. That is the biggest certainty ever. So you're never as bad as you think you are when you're out of form and you're never as good as you think you are when you're absolutely flying. You remember those two things and remember, if anything, when it comes to staking, when things are going well, when the ball's falling for you, when the things are going your way, the penalties are offside and you're getting a few quid, that's the time to maybe have just a little bit more on, just increasing your punting a little bit. And when you bang out of form, when those bad things are happening and you can't find a winner and everything's going against you, go a little bit less. Play your comment, just... Cut your stakes a little bit. And, and and I think those things those things are very important, especially that last one about cutting your stakes because it's when you're out of form that you get numb. It's a bit like being in a fight. The first two punches alert you, but all of a sudden you will become numb. And that's what gambling's like. Well, don't become numb because the next day is the next day. You know, there's, al you know, there's always tomorrow. So don't think I'm going to back a winner any moment now because you ain't necessarily so. Really try and keep your shape when you get in a battery. And that's, that's strong advice, I'd say. Absolutely. Very sage advice. So the book, Harry's book, it's Gambling for Life by Neil Harmon. You can get it on Amazon and anywhere else, I'm sure. So 
I suggest everyone grab a copy and have a read. There's some great stories. Um, you know, we said earlier, if half of them are true, it's a unbelievable life. And I think we touched on it, two or three of them here. So I suggest... I think, I think the best thing about it is, I think it was written, most of it, sort of certainly three quarters of it were written when I was really on the floor, Jake. And um, the prison chapter, etc., cetera, was, is, is as honest as you can possibly get. And um, all of it is. Um, but I, I, I do believe that even the begrudges will get a few laughs out of this book. I'll be very upset if, if the if the average person doesn't get four or five laugh out louds at this book. I, I'll, I'll be disappointed. No, I'm sure they'll definitely enjoy it, punters and non-punters. So, uh, And also the Matchbook Traders Conference, November 1st, I think, Harry, you said. Is that right? Yeah, November the 1st, yeah. All right, Harry, I really appreciate your time. It was great having a chat. I look forward to meeting you one day soon. And uh, thanks again for coming on the podcast. Cheers, Jake. All the best, mate.